Luis, let's talk about the opening to your book and about the word chaconics. So, you know, people want to call us all kinds of things. We're called Hispanics. We're called Latinos. All of these is made up. You know what I'm saying? Mexican American. These are made up terms. Uh, I grew up that way. I didn't never call myself that. I mean, you can say that, especially if you're born in this country or you're raised here, you're, you're an American. I get that. A lot of Americans, I'm an American, I have a passport, that's one way to identify, but there's other ways to identify, and that is culturally, that is by uh, language, all kinds of ways. You know, it's like Cajuns in Louisiana, there's people that have different histories within the country, Native Americans, tribes all over. So what are Chicanos? Chicanos are basically the Mexican people who have been here uh, before anybody else was here and or who came later. and it's just a word that means connected to the indigenous of Mexico, the Mexicano, the Mexica people. And then Chicano becomes a shortened way of saying it. I just use it because it was a name in the 60s that the movement people picked up. It doesn't really mean that I want anybody to use that term. I'm not trying to be politically correct here. People, years from now, it'll be a different name. But Chicanx also has the inclusiveness of including all genders and gender non-conforming people, which is in Spanish you use A or O, depending on what gender you're talking about. This is everybody. So that's the reason why I use it, just because it's a term that I can relate to and I can say I name myself. I'm not a foreigner. I'm not an alien. I'm not undocumented. I'm not all these terms that everybody throws at us. Mm -hmm. Um. Speaking of identity, um, you mentioned in your in your book um, some of the shifts to the national conversation and the way that um, people have viewed immigrants, especially from um, Mexico and from South American countries um, since the 2016 election. Um, have there been important um I, I think we all know that there have been some very negative and, and difficult things during this time have there been important um positive things that you have seen in the last four years have there been um has there been anything that's come out of that um difficulty that you think of as remarkable well one of the things i mentioned in the book is that steve bannon you know, uh, you know who he was. He was um, in the in the White House. Said that they wanted to do all these things to trigger the loony left. That was his whole thing. We're gonna get them going. Well, they might get some people going, but I think what they really got going was two things: one, an organized response, peaceful organized response. People I know of are organizing uh, against voting for Trump, which they're gonna try to work through all the way to November, but also organizing for climate change with Greta Thunberg is one of the leading, but not the only one, but obviously one of the leading voices, organizing for women's rights, for Me Too, for all, there's so much organizing and it's peaceful. It's just, mm -hmm. and of course, Black Lives Matter is part of it. There's, I think people are getting organized and not getting loony, they're not going crazy. Of course, some people are, but most of them are not. You know what I'm saying? Most yeah. of them are saying, we're gonna have to get ourselves organized. We're gonna change the world. We're gonna have to do it in a way it can only be done. Organizing people, give people knowledge, awareness, and consciousness, and get them tools to make their own agency in the world. To me, that's the main thing that happened. Now, the other side that did get triggered, which is even more triggered than whatever the loony left that Steve Bannon was talking about, was the right-wing white supremacist nationalist movement. That is very um, evident. It's not as many people as people can imagine, but it's enough people where you have to pay attention to them. And they're the ones right now protesting the COVID-19 restrictions yeah. the ones with guns. They got Confederate flags, especially in Michigan. I've seen some of the, the film um, that they're, they're, they got nooses. This is the part that is being triggered. A small section of people, um, mostly poor working class who have bought into whatever uh, Trump and or the right wing or particularly the extreme right wing have put forward. They call them all rights and everything. So to me, I think we're looking at two phenomena. They are, mm -hmm. I think, dangerous in the sense that they've said, we will go to war against other Americans, other liberals, you know, they're not Americans. You know, they've already declared war. I, I said, there's a low level civil war already happening. People have already been dying, even though it might be, you know, 
loose groups of people. But I do think what's significant is the organizing among, what do you want to call them? I don't think it's the left. I just think it's social justice, progressive, people that want to see a new world change. That to me is the big uh, issue that I found positive. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I was as I was looking back over your book today, I was remembering um, how you write about borders and defining identity and kind of what you were speaking about um, at the beginning too, that that these things are a historical necessity and they're kind of made up. They're things that people have used at different um, points. And you say at one point, um, in spirit, I'm borderless. And you say, I belong anywhere. And um, I really felt throughout the essays, your sense of just connection to um, to people and to culture and less to these sort of arbitrarily defined um, ideas of border and of labels, you know? Um, no, go ahead. So I, I was thinking as you were talking, how much thousands of years all of us have been migrants. Mm -hmm. We've all migrated. Migrancy is part of humanity. There was no borders. I mean, people had famines. They would migrate to better lands. They would migrate for a lot of reasons, some good, some for, for terrible conditions. Migrancy was part of who we are as human beings. The earth accepted everybody. It didn't have a place where you don't belong here. You can't put that foot here. Only human beings tell you, wait a minute. This is another country. This is another place. Where's your passport? You belong here. You don't belong here. Human beings begin to make the fences and the restrictions. And now we don't belong in most part of the world. Unless, of course, we have the proper paperwork. Everything changed. And I think that just goes along with also the development of capitalism, which had, had a lot of industry. And then there was markets. And markets had to be clearly defined. And so we got a whole world that's been created on top of the world that most people understood. As everybody's indigenous roots is, is that we tend to go where we need to go. We tend to use the earth only as far as we need. We don't take more than we have to. We don't really necessarily want to own the air, own the land, or own space the way that some people are looking at the world. I've got this piece of land, I'm going to own it. I got this piece of air, I'm going to own it. I got the space. You know, they were selling moon shot, uh, spots, you know, for a while. Mm -hmm. So it's like, to me, that's what I want to get back to. Uh, with the new technology we have with the world going forward to go back to some very, I think, important values and principles that all human beings had. And that is the shared well-being of everyone, which I think is forgotten. And also that what's common to every human being should never be owned by anybody. I get you want to have personal property. I get you want to own your car, whatever. Um, but, but even all that is illusions. Mortgage is a big illusion. So anyway, that's a whole different issue. But what I'm saying is there's things that should belong to all of us. It's common to all of us, and we shouldn't um, own it. We should allow people to have access to it. So that's what I'm trying to put forward, a new way of thinking that's actually very old. Yeah. What do you make of, um, I know you write about this in your in your book as well, what do you make of our current fixation with DNA tests and heritage yeah. you write about your own experience yeah. with that so I, I think it's well i learned it's, it's 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 flawed you know dna right now we're not developed to the point where we really can get and it doesn't really determine race you can't determine race from dna all you can do at least the, the the dna test now is possibly go back a thousand years maybe not that far and all you can do is take what other people have tested in other words you take a lot of dna from a lot of other people and then they give you a, a correlation to how you fit in with that it's not really your own particular dna it's the dna of you in relationship to all the people who, who have gone for it so i find it to be uh very entertaining mm -hmm. i didn't First, I was taking it very seriously. Uh, um, as you know, I have a thing about me and my wife taking our DNA. And the main thing we found out is we got the whole world in us. Northern Mexico, Jalisco, Chihuahua, us, is very vibrant with the whole world. Um, you know, from Europe, from Africa, as people may or may not know, from Middle East, uh, Asia, but also, of course, our native roots. Both me and her are half Native American, according to the DNA test. Again, that's looking at people from that same area, all testing. So uh, do I actually have half? I don't know, and who cares? <laughs> you know, because yeah. the really for me isn't that it matters in the long run because as my, um, we got my family, Trini and me got adopted by a Navajo elder uh, in the Diné Reservation, and we went to him with this, and he told us a very beautiful thing. He said, listen, it's entertaining, it's, you know, interesting, but to remember, 
Nobody's fractured. Nobody's this part, that, this part, that. Nobody's got this kind of blood, that kind of blood. We are whole and complete as we are. So to me, I wanted to end that whole essay with, it doesn't really matter what my DNA is. Mm -hmm. I am whole and complete as I am. However I came here, I am human being, whatever it is. I turn towards my indigenous as a choice because I do have a mother who's Tarumara Raramuri, uh, even though she didn't grow up traditionally, she knew she was from that tradition. And of course, other tribal stuff. I just go there as a choice, but I don't really think it's what really matters. It's a human being here. It's a human being speaking. And that's what's important to me. Yeah. You mentioned also in the book, um, the distinction, and we talked about it in our written interview as well, the distinction between um, native and tribal. Um, can you just talk for just a minute about um, how you, what you wrote about that distinction? So uh, one of my good friends before he passed was John Trudell who was a leader of the um, American Indian movement in the 60s and 70s and became a famous poet and a speaker for what Native Americans are. And he, his grandmother was actually Tarumara, like my grandmother and my great grandmother and partly my mom. So we kind of talked about how our grandmothers were talking, bringing us together. I learned a lot from him. Um, and one of the things I learned is that uh, all Indian peoples, their names for themselves was really like the word, the people you know, the human being, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you say Tarumara, it means the free-footed people, or if you have another name, you know, it wasn't a tribe, like this is my tribe and I hear my piece of land and I'm gonna name it after that. It was just the word for the people, the human being. Mm -hmm. So that's really what we are. Tribal, I'm not against using the tribe, obviously, but it, it's an anthropological word. It comes from a certain point of history, how you have to anthropologically look at people, and here's a tribal, and here's a racial group, all these things. We really aren't tribes in that sense. We are the people for whoever part of this land, this history that we're part of. And I think that's, to me, important. When I say I'm indigenous, I'm really saying I'm a human being, I'm a people. It's not doesn't make superiority or inferiority, whatever I am. If I say Chicanx, it just means a certain people during a certain historical period that I'm putting forward. But really the ultimate thing is I'm a human being regardless of where we are. And I will be that even in the future, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, so I'm a high school teacher in addition to being a, a book critic. And um, one of the essays that stood out to me um, was where you write about working with um, young students in high schools in East LA, and you talk about creating safe spaces. And um, also you, you talk about the necessity of poetry, about how important um, poetry is. And I, um, I would like you just to kind of speak about that, about you know poetry and education, why that's important, but just for everybody. Um, and especially as we're trying to process some really difficult things, I think about um, the COVID-19 experience that we're all having. Um, why is poetry important? And how do you think that people can get some more poetry into their lives? Well, one of the things I found out is I never learned poetry when I did go to high school. And I didn't do very well in high school as a dropout. I did finally get back up my diploma. But I didn't learn literature. I never read Shakespeare. Never, my schools weren't into that. I don't know why we weren't taught poetry. If it's not taught, but yet poetry kept coming out of us. There was a lot of poets in East LA. They were trying to do poetry the way that they sensed it and felt it. I started reading all these African-American poets that were coming out in that time. Don Ali, who became my friend, Hanki Mahabuti, he had a book called um, Scream, Don't Cry. Hope I got the right title. It was powerful for me. Nikki Giovanni was writing. Uh, mm -hmm. Sonia Sanchez later on. All these, these African-American poets and uh, opened up my eyes, including the the, um, the uh, Puerto Rican poets at the time who were coming out. There wasn't that many Chicano poets published. And so I had to look for them. I found that poetry is what high school kids do almost naturally, even if they're not taught what poetry does. So you have groups in LA like Get Lit Players, which actually goes into the schools and teaches people real poetry, teaches them the rhythms of poetry, what free verse does, what metered poetry does, rhyming. It gives them all this teaching, but also encourages them to find your own voice, find your own story. And to me, that's what's important because young people are doing it without great, great historical knowledge. I never read Shakespeare. I never saw Shakespeare appear until I was 45 years old in Ashland, Oregon. It was an amazing experience. Why didn't I get it earlier? 
I love Shakespeare. I'm not saying that he's in the dead white guy, he's better than anybody else, but for what he contributes, I wish I knew more about him. I've been doing sonnets in this experience style ever since, because I just love that form. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's, it's all valuable. And that's what I would encourage people to understand. Poetry is hard to monetize though. I don't think it's, it's the center of culture the way music, the way uh, even rap has been monetized, the way other cultures, uh, our art forms get monetized. Theater can be, uh, poetry is hard to monetize. So I don't think it's got that, that same thing where industry comes in. There might be a po biz that people talk about, there are poetry business somewhere, you know, and some people are fighting for a few grants and a little bit of notoriety. But to me, mostly poetry is just so talk, just opening up to the imagery and language and the stories that can come out and that the, the way they're shaped, it's a way in which music is made without necessarily music going along with it. You talked about the three E's that you teach your students when they're writing. Can you share what those are? So I, I wanted to emphasize three very important parts of writing that I found. Uh, one is, of course, is um, you have to examine your life. I mean, Socrates is credited with saying an unexamined life is not worth living. I always found that to be important. Somebody said it wasn't Socrates. I don't know. Somebody, can <laughs> But the point is, it's a very important statement. You got to examine your life. How do you do it? Writing is one of the most powerful ways. It's not the only way. It's just powerful. I'm working with guys who have been in prison. Some of them life prison men. I'm working with guys in juvenile halls, not just guys, women too. I'm looking for working in schools with some of the so-called worst students, even though they're amazing when I'm working with them. Um, how do they find a way to examine where they've been? What are their patterns? What are their life patterns? What do they need to change? How do, writing is powerful. The second thing is to evoke. In other words, you gotta go to some depth. It's almost like you're mining all the, the the minerals in your in your world, including the minerals that have to do with trauma, or with joy, with neglect, with betrayal, everything you've been through, what are you mining? Uh, underneath all the mud and terrible things that people think they have, there's always a really beautiful mineral there. There's always gold or diamond, there's always something there. And you gotta get through all that nonsense to get to that deep, that depth. So I, I always say, go to the depth, mind all of it you can, tell all parts of it, details, it's bad and good because it's all going to be helpful and healing. And then the third thing, of course, is to express it. How do you do it? Uh, poetry allows many forms. Uh, some of the most powerful is just the performance spoken word kind of slam poetry, which has been popular now, especially with young people. Of course, there's, there's hip hop and rap way of expressing. There is metered poetry. There is rhyme poetry. There's all kinds of ways. But that's just not the only way. There's stories you can write. There's novels. I got guys in prison writing plays and scripts for movies, doing amazing work. Some of them writing for years. They may not ever see their work go anywhere because of the way we tend to don't want to hear from them. But I encourage them. That's important, find an expression for what your life's about. That's great. Do you think the pandemic is gonna change literature? Do you think there's gonna be um, new or, or different things that come out of this time? Well, I think one of the things I'm seeing already, and I hope I'm part of it, is for us to open up an imagination for something different. I'm seeing already now people writing op-eds and there's stories and even poetry where we have to imagine something new, the pandemic, all bad. Nobody wants pandemics. But this <laughs> pandemic has also, and the crisis opened up something that needs to be born. Something has to die. Something new has to happen. And I think we're in, in that stage. I don't think um, the step after chaos is order. It's, it's creativity. And we have to really nurture that creativity end of it. How do we create it now in this time? How do we make sure that, in fact, everybody's health is taken care of, not just a few people with money? What is this pandemic showing, but all the fissures and fractures and all the gaps in our capitalist, cultural, political, and economic reality. There's so many gaps there. People want to go back to normal, but I go, normal wasn't too hot the last time we left it. There was yeah. high suicides. There was opioids killing people. There was homelessness, especially in LA and other parts. And I always tell people, why is LA so got so much homeless or San Francisco or even Seattle? Because these are successful cities. They're successful capitalist cities. That's what happens when you be successful. People are pushed out and people act like this is what's well, terrible. They want to blame liberals or whatever. I don't, you can't blame it, but the system itself does this. So we have to reimagine something else. Another world is possible, as I say in my book, and we have to reimagine how to realize that world. But the first step is to use their imaginative powers. 
and then think about the next thing, which is how do we make it real for everyone? Mm -hmm. What are you What are you working on now? What's your next project? Well, I'm working on several things at once. I have a play that I did of always running my best-selling memoir that showed did very well last year at Casa Zero One on One Theater in Boyle Heights. We wanted to bring it to the French Hollywood Fringe Theater Festival. It's been postponed. In October, if everything goes well and everybody's safely able to get out there, hopefully we'll have the festival and we'll be part of that. I want to rewrite it for the community. It's a very important story. I also am working on a lot of poetry. I found poetry to be very soothing and healing at this time. I got, as you know, all genres. I can write novels, books. I got short stories. I got a lot of things. But right now, I feel like poetry is happening. I also got a speculative fiction bug. I'm doing some, what they used to call science fiction. It's kind of like seeing the world through a different prism of today for the future. So uh, there will be a book about uh, LA, uh, speculative friction that's coming out in the fall. And I'm leaning towards that too. But really right now, poetry seems to be my best way of talking about what we're going through right now. Great. You have something uh, that you'd like to read for us today from your book? So. What I thought I would read is, you kind of mentioned it, but I would read, like to read the beginning of the first essay called The End of Belonging. And just to get people a sense of where the essays are all going to go. And it goes like this. Um, a week after the national elections in November of 2016, a muscle-bound, tattooed white man stood outside a large room in at San Bernardino Valley College in California, berating the mostly brown-skinned students trying to get inside. He lashed out about how they didn't belong and were criminals and job stealers. You know, the usual corrosive anti-Mexican rants that have soared in number since Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Um, and I'm going to skip some lines. Uh, they wanted to um, maybe attack this guy. Some people came up to me, let's attack him. I said, no, no, I think let him come in. I want to see how uh, if he gets off and rants, we'll handle it. But I wanted him to come in. So um, when once he got in, there was about 400 people there. He found a seat. I told the group that even though I'm a Mexican descent, I'm no immigrant. My mother had roots with the Tarumara people from the state of Chihuahua, also known as the Radahamari. This tribe is associated linguistically and in other ways with the Hopi, Soshone, Paiute, Tohono Autumn and Pueblo peoples, all the way down to the Mexica of Central Mexico, the Pipil of El Salvador, the Nahuac speak, speaking tribes of, of Nicaragua, in fact, with all tribes throughout the hemisphere. Just before I was born, my mother crossed an international bridge from Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, to El Paso, Texas. That year was 1954. I'm an anchor baby, and so what? Migrants from Europe, including many pregnant women, lining up at Ellis Island, some ready to burst. More than 350 babies were born there in the 60-year history. More notably, the Chihuahuan Desert cuts a large swathe through the U.S. Southwest and Northern Mexico. The Raramari have resided in the Chihuahua Desert for at least 8,000 years of the desert's existence, way before the Spanish, the Portuguese, the English, or French, before borders, before, quote, legal documents. El Paso is within the confines of this desert, which intersects two nations and several states. When my mother gave birth to me across the border, we went from our land to our land. And that eventually became the title for the whole book of essays. I love it. Um, your book gives me so much hope and um, it it's the kind of book that I want to put into the hands of my students and everybody I know. You know, it, it's um, thought provoking and it's realistic, but it's um, that, like I said, there's definitely hope there and that it just it's just wonderful. Where can people find you if they want to find you online? So I have a website, LuisJRodriguez.com. I also encourage people to go to the Cultural Center bookstore that I created 20 years ago in the San Fernando Valley section of Los Angeles. It's called Tia Chucha Centro Cultural and Bookstore. And that is at T-I-A-C-H-U-C-H-A dot org. There's also online um, bookstore there. You can order books, you can order my books, a lot of other books. You can do online open mics, online social justice book clubs. There's a lot of stuff there. And I also want to encourage people to look up the Hummingbird Cricket Hour. It is a podcast that me and my wife started. We have more than two dozen um, 
podcast right now that we've done, just go to Google, put the Hummingbird Cricket Hour shows up. We're on Lip Scene, we're on Apple Cast podcast, we're in a lot of places. And hopefully you'll like what we have to say. Wonderful. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. We're going to have Beth come back. And if we have questions from the audience, we'll take those now. Sounds great. I'm coming back. Oh, sorry, Heather. I just got rid of you instead of adding me. Hold on. <laughs> it's been <amazing. laughs> I'm adding all those links, folks. So um, all of the things that Luis just mentioned, his website, um, his podcast, it's all over here in the chat. Um, first of all, that was just such a great talk. I'm all smiles over just listening to the two of you. That was great. And thanks to um, everyone. I do have a couple of questions before we go. Uh, the first, Luis, other than yourself, which poet would you like to see read at the next presidential inauguration, no matter who wins, Biden or Trump? <laughs> well, well, Trump ain't going to be no poet, as you know. Uh, but I would like to see, regardless, um, uh, strong women voices, particularly uh, the, the young women who are writing. Um, there's Erica Sanchez. There's um, uh, Miriam uh, Gerba, there's a few voices that are starting to rise up that I would like to see be there. Uh, one of the guys that I really want to support, though, is a, a Salvadorian, uh, formerly undocumented poet uh, named Javier Z Zamora. I would think that's a very powerful uh, poet. He did a book of poetry called uh, Undocumented. So th these are the voices that i like to see there. That, um, I guess that ties into our second question, which are, can you recommend some up and coming poets that, that are our viewers um, and listeners should check out. Any in addition to those that you mentioned? Well, let me see. Um, um, maybe I should say we should reread some of the old well-known poets that have done. Juan Felipe Herrera was a U.S. poet laureate, powerful poet. People should reread him. Uh, Joy Harjo is now a current poet laureate, a Native American, powerful, amazing poet. And she also has a really great memoir called Crazy Brave. So those they're older, they've been around, but they've laid the groundwork for a lot of us. And I think some of the older poets with the younger poets would be very powerful reads. Um, last question, it's a, it's a big ask. Would you be willing to read one of the poems or a part of a poem that you've written about this time of the pandemic and Corona? Well, no, it's kind of like they're not shaped properly yet. Um, and I hate to read it as part of them, um, but I hope soon I'll have some poems that I could share. Uh, I just hate to do it until they're ready, you know. Okay, we won't we won't make you go into a draft before it's a masterpiece. Yeah. Um, this is great. If you've got any other questions for Luis um, or Heather, um, ping me and I will try and get them answered via whatever channels are possible. I want to thank everyone for tuning in today, um, especially dealing with my uh, technical difficulties. So thanks for putting up with us and sticking with us. This has been an absolute treat. Thank you to Heather, of course, and Luis. Um, you have really great energy and I feel like I learned so much as I know so many of our viewers did. So thank you. This conversation will be up online later today. Um, please, if you're so inspired to support um, independent bookstores and Luis, you can buy the book at the button right underneath you. Um, and thanks so much. Join us next week at the same time for a conversation with Kimmy Eisel. Um, thanks everyone. Be well. Thank you. Bye. You need to throw me off. <laughs>